Ah, you ignorant slaves. Finally taken notice, have you? Of the power of my beloved Ocelot. That's Major Ocelot to you. And don't you forget it. Internet, welcome to Game Theory, where today, get ready, because I'm about to touch the darkness within you. Then touch the darkness within me. That sounded so wrong. And watch where your hand's going there, Ashen One. Acting pretty fiery there for an unkindled. That's right, theorists, today it's time for Dark Souls. What, you only thought I looked at games built on cartoonishly overblown racial stereotypes? Nope. In fact, Dark Souls is, without question, my favorite modern gaming franchise. And I've been eager to put it under the old theory microscope for a long time. But the reason it's taken this long is that for as impenetrable as the mysteries of games like Undertale and FNAF are, Dark Souls as a franchise is on a whole nother level. Because even the most basic information that we take for granted in other games is completely hidden away in these games. There aren't any long-winded speeches from characters explaining their motivations. There aren't books filled with game lore strewn about. Heck, it's not even like Destiny where the story's documented on a separate site. Let's face it, what little dialogue there is, is written like a riddle. Long story short, you can play through the entire franchise and still essentially know nothing about these games' story. So, tell me, as a non-initiated gamer who is interested in these games, what's the goal of Dark Souls? Uh, light a fire? Why? Cause it's, uh, going out, being extinguished. Why's that matter? Cause... It'll get dark, I guess. P praise the sun. Praise the sun, guys. Praise the sun! And scene. Thank you, thank you. I feel like my theater background really, really came into play there. And you know what? It doesn't make these games any less fun. Dark Souls is a franchise that is built on making you work for things. And most of us associate that with the brutal gameplay that, if you work at it, you can absolutely master. But it also applies to the story half of the game, too. Because there is an incredibly rich and complex lore that from software created that 99% of players will never really appreciate, since most of it is hidden in obscure NPC dialogue, level design, and item descriptions. You have to do some painstaking work to piece the random trivia bits together. And I'm not exaggerating when I say painstaking. I have 20 pages of notes just for this video. But that, loyal theorists, is what I'm here for. To turn my video game fun time into meticulous, boring research time, so I can boil it down into a theory that'll give you all a newfound appreciation for the work that went into incredible game franchises like this one. So now, without any further ado, on to the theory. Playing through Dark Souls 3, there was a burning question that occupied the back of my mind and bugged the heck out of me like Navi screaming, Hey, listen! Who is the main character of the game? Who are you playing as? Because believe it or not, I think that your character in Dark Souls 3 does have an identity, a full backstory beyond that of unwilling murder puppet who rolls and attacks and praises the sun. But in order to figure it out, I needed to cover a lot of ground and fit together a lot of puzzle pieces. Remember, 20 pages of notes. But standing on the other side of that research, I think we found something really cool. So squat a lot, my friends, hop aboard and join me on an incredible research journey through gaming's most depressing franchise. First, when it comes to Dark Souls, I can't assume anyone knows anything, so let's all start by making sure that we're on the same page about the franchise's story. Our first dose of lore comes from the intro cinematic of Dark Souls 1. The story begins a long time ago during the Age of Ancients, a time when everything was gray and boring and like a Tim Burton film. During this era, dragons ruled everything, and it sucked for pretty much everyone else. Then boom, magical fire erupts from deep beneath the earth, and a few people claim that fire for themselves, transforming into lords. They kill the dragons, build kingdoms, and yay, everything is slightly less depressing. Very slightly. Thus began the Age of Fire. But over time, the power of the fire started to fade, and these god folks started to panic. Gwyn, one of the lords, sacrificed himself, allowing his soul to fuel the flame and extend the Age of Fire a little bit longer. In Dark Souls 1, the flame
flame is once again fading away, and your character is tasked with the duty of killing all the previous lords, including Gwyn himself, in order to become strong enough to decide to either link the fire and keep the age going, or extinguish the fire and usher in the Age of Dark. Dark Souls 2, basically the same thing, and then finally we get to Dark Souls 3, which takes place an unknown period of time in the future. The Age of Fire has been extended a whole bunch of times, and when the game starts, the fire is about to fade again. If that sounds repetitive, yeah, it kinda is. But this time, it is very slightly different. You see, in previous Souls games, your character was a human afflicted with the undead curse. Undead are basically zombies, humans who've died but have been reanimated and can still think and feel for themselves, at least for a while. Eventually, if they stay undead for long enough without reclaiming their humanity, they're doomed to go hollow, which is, well, actually it's just going full-on mindless zombie. But in Dark Souls 3, yes, you're still undead, but more importantly, you're what's known as Unkindled or Unkindled Ash. There's not a lot of explanation about what this means in-game outside of a few hints sprinkled here and there, but we do actually have another source that describes what an Unkindled really is, Hidetaka Miyazaki, the lead creative director for the Souls series. In an interview in Taiwan, he actually describes exactly what the main character of Dark Souls 3 is. The gist of it is basically that Dark Souls 3 depicts undead warriors who didn't successfully link the fire in their first attempt and were burnt to ashes in their defeat. This means that Dark Souls 3 protagonist, as well as every other unkindled character that you meet in the game, is basically someone who would and could have been the protagonist, your character in the first two Souls games, but weren't strong enough to actually continue the Age of Fire, so they were burnt away into ash. So why then is our character, or any of the other unkindled characters, resurrected at all? Well, they almost weren't. You see, to continue the Age of Fire this time around, four Lords of Cinder, aka warriors who actually did succeed in linking the fire in the past were resurrected first so that they could try to relink the fire. Aldrich, the Devourer of Gods, the Abyss Watchers, Yorm the Giant, and Ludlith of Corland. If Dark Souls 3 were a reality TV show, it'd basically be All-Stars Edition. Except, instead of burning themselves with magical fire for a second go around like good reincarnated warriors, they all just said, screw that, and left to do their own thing. It'd be like summoning an NPC helper and they suddenly just say no and walk away. But can you blame them? If you attack Ludlith, then reload the area, you actually get this rare bit of dialogue out of him. He's asleep and reliving being burned by that less than eternal flame. Please, help me. Be done with me. Ugh, being a hero sucks. Are you feeling overwhelmed? I don't blame you, but you know what? There's a lot more to go before we can get to the really good stuff. So if you need a breather, here's a photo of me performing High School Musical. Ah, uh, baby Matt Pat, there are so many things I want to tell you about the future, and yet you elude me. Guess you'll just have to learn them the hard way. But alas, no more trying to commune with the past breaks over. So far, we've mostly talked about the story that you can more or less put together yourself if you watch the intro cinematics of these three games a few times and beat the games all the way through. But now, it's time to dive into item description. You see, each item in the game, and I do mean every single item in the game, has a short snippet describing the item itself, as well as a tiny fragment of information about the world around you. That sword, boom, lore. That spell, boom, lore. Those pants, boom, lore. Who thought that the key behind understanding the entire Dark Souls franchise would be hidden in my dragon scale waist cloth the whole time? Now, as I mentioned before, the Age of Fire always, always fades, and in order to keep it going, someone really powerful has to sacrifice themselves to keep the fire burning. That's why the Lords of Cinder in Dark Souls 3 were brought back in the first place, and why, when they pieced out, your character was also brought back. But that bears the question, why bring back anyone at all? Why couldn't anyone living have done it in the first place? Well, someone was supposed to, but didn't. You see, the person who was supposed to link the fire and the one who decided they wouldn't in the first place is one of the final bosses of the game, Prince Lothric and his older brother, Lorien. Good old Hodor and Bran, and we know this via the item description for the spell Soul Stream. Quote, Sorcery imparted by the first of the scholars, when Lothric and the Grand Archives were but young. The first of the scholars doubted the linking of the fire and was alleged to be a private mentor to the royal prince. End quote. So Lothric grew up being tutored by the scholars, scholars who taught him to reject the fire linking ritual. So when it was his time to do it, he decided instead, nah, linking the fire sounds boring. Let's watch the world as we know it fade away. And we can confirm this by dissecting the obscure dialogue he speaks to lead into his boss fight. The mantle of Lord interests me none. The fire-linking curse, the legacy of lords, let it all fade into nothing. 
So Prince Lothric says, nope, not gonna do it because he was raised to doubt the task that his family's done for generations, then goes off to his castle to watch the world burn. Some men just wanna watch the world burn. And so then someone was like, uh, well, that's bad. What do we do now? Then Bill from Accounting steps up and is like, hey, I know how we can link the fire without putting our quarterly budget in the red. How about we bring back four of the last dudes to link the fire? And of course, that didn't work either, because Bill from Accounting's ideas always suck. And so now here we are, relying on the unkindled, basically the third stringers, the long shot of all long shots, undead who failed to link the fire before and for their failed efforts were burnt like crispy yet inedible bacon. That's like some substituting Jimmy's t-ball team in when the Yankees go on strike. But more importantly, knowing all of this, you're probably asking, hey, MatPat, what's any of this got to do with the identity of the main character? Well, stay patient, I'm getting there. In Dark Souls 3, you actually encounter other unkindled characters, three of which are of note. Henri of Astora, Sigward of Katarina, and Hawkwood the Deserter. Why am I mentioning these? Well, because all three of these have very special links to the game world and to our identity in the game. Henri was an orphan who was held captive by a group of cultists who worshipped Aldrich, one of the Lords of Cinder. You get a snapshot of the story from the description of the Executioner's set of armor worn by Henri's companion Horus. Quote, Steel armor of Horus the Hushed, who took a liking to its cold, bulky insides. The original owner was said to be a corrupt executioner who was killed and stripped of his armor. Horus is one of only two children to escape Aldrich's clutches. End quote. The other child being, of course, Henri. The rest of the children, as we hear from both Hawkwood the Deserter and Henri herself, were fed to Aldrich. My duty must be done for the children I knew. Bless their souls. Aldrich, he developed a habit of devouring men. because everybody knows that orphans are a part of a balanced breakfast. <clears throat> In the game, Henri can be summoned to help you fight the minions of Aldrich, the sub-bosses that lead to his encounter including the Deacons of the Deep, Pontiff Sullivan, and eventually, Aldrich himself. Sir Onionite Sigward, my favorite character from the game meanwhile, wields the greatsword Storm Ruler, a sword meant to slay giants. But looking at the item description, we learn that there's a much longer history to this blade. Quote, Greatsword with a broken blade, also known as the Giant Slayer for the residual strength of Storm that brings giants to their knees. Yorm the Giant once held two of these, but gave one to the humans that doubted him and left the other to a dear friend before facing his fate as a Lord of Cinder. End quote. So we know that there are, in fact, two of these swords, and at one point, both were owned by Yorm. One was given to his subjects in the profaned capital as a sort of medieval form of checks and balances, and the other was given to a dear friend who is almost certainly Sigward, who actually says at one point that he has a grave promise to keep in the profaned capital. You can summon him for the Yorm battle, and after you help him kill the boss, he thanks you for helping him to complete his promise. And finally, that leaves Hawkwood. Hawkwood the Deserter, a guy who just sits around and whines at the Firelink Shrine for what seems like the entire game. I mean, I know it sucks that you were reborn to become the human equivalent of a matchstick, but geez, lighten up a little. In my first playthrough, I completely wrote this guy off, but in researching this episode, I started to pay closer attention. He doesn't make much mention of it, but look at his armor. It's the same design as the Abyss Watchers, another of the Lords of Cinder. He also knows a lot about their operations and the overall structure of the Undead Legion, and all of this makes perfect sense. Just take one more good look at his name, Hawkwood the Deserter. Think that's just a random title? No. In one word, From Software tells us this guy's whole backstory. He was clearly once a member of the Abyss Watchers of the Undead Legion and left for some reason. Maybe, I don't know, he didn't want to burn like a human candle. And unlike the other NPCs who help you with their associated boss battle, he doesn't help you fight the Abyss Watchers, which makes a ton of sense. He was once one of them. He'd be fighting his fellow soldiers. In one minor design decision, From Software has told you everything you need to know about this guy. So, as you can see, we're presented with three unkindled NPCs that each have direct ties to one of the Lords of Cinder that must be killed in order to link the fire. And this makes a ton of sense when you think about it. If you're sending someone on what is essentially a suicide mission to hunt down someone with godlike strength, you want them to have motivation. You want them to want to do it. Three unkindled for three Lords of Cinder. But does something seem missing? That's right. An unkindled specifically 
sent to assassinate the princes of Lothric, which is where you come in. You too have a history in this land, a past tied to the twin princes, but what exactly that is and what it means for the identity of your character, we'll have to wait till next time.